son came in and he said, there's a huge pile of dead chicks up on the second shelf in the well house. So I wanted to make a video today about uh, pretty much why we haven't been on here very much recently. We've had some rather uh, interesting things happen. Last year was, um, you know, I know last year was really hard on a lot of people because of this, the craziness that was just going on in the world. It wasn't that way for us. Last year was a pretty good year for us. This year has not. It reminds me that not everything is peaches and roses and rainbows and, you know, wonderful things on a farm. But there's risk. There's tragedy. There's hardship. There's pain. Um, there's the unexpected. There's the financial strain. There's just things that I didn't experience last year. And we are experiencing that this year. Um, I think one of the first things that happened is, and this all funny, it all happened in one week. We got Annabelle. She's been wonderful. She really has been wonderful. She's not um, a lovey-dovey cow at all, but she does very well. She likes her routine. She likes things being the same, and she's happiest that way. So we're doing very, very well with her. She's milking twice a day giving us roughly between two and two and a half gallons uh, each milking. So she's producing a lot of milk. Uh, Daisy's producing more, but um, between the two of them, they're doing very well for us. It was not last week, but the week before. We, uh, I had just had my last batch of um, meat birds arrive. And that was on a Thursday, and it was raining awfully. And then Friday afternoon, yeah, I asked my son and my daughter to check on the chicks. And, um, you know, that's that was normal for us. They had just checked on them the night before. They were doing great. They had plenty of food, plenty of water, so we weren't worried. Um, and it was raining so much. The next day, Friday afternoon, they came inside, and this is like 24 hours, 30 hours after I got them home, 75 meat birds plus about 12 American breast chicks that I had hatched a week and a half before that were in there as well. And then, um, yeah, I think that was it. There were a total of 99 birds. Just trying to remember how many I don't remember how it all comes what it all comes to but there were 99 birds in there Friday or Thursday when I put them all in Friday afternoon my son came in and he said there's a huge pile of dead chicks up on the second shelf in the well house 30 hours after they've been put in there were 99 to start with. There were only 35 left. And most of those were the American breast chicks that I had hatched out myself. Um, and those are for breeding purposes. Those are not for meat. I think I had, I want to say about 15 meat birds left out of the 75 that I had purchased. Um, and two-day-old chicks are not going to jump up on a second shelf. They, they can't. A rat had gotten in there and decimated my flock. Um, okay, so Quick bought a livestock tank. That was expensive. Put that in my house, rescued whatever birds were left, brought them into the house, got them warmed up, food, and they thrived. Um, our house stunk. But, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, so the well house is out of the question now for using as a brooder. I, I've done everything I can do. I've um, hardware cloth on quarter inch. 
quarter inch hardware cloth. Everything I can think of, the floors, the walls, the eaves, I mean everything. Um, so I, I don't know how it was getting in there, but I know a rat was getting in there. Uh, anyway, the, uh, that was Thursday, Mon or Friday, Monday of that same week, earlier that week. I had gotten a call from our vet that Valentine, our, my favorite cow that I thought was just going to stay with me forever and, you know, I would just keep her until she was old and gray and, but I started noticing she had issues with her udder and it was immediately after she calved, she had mastitis and it was weird. It was a weird kind of mastitis. But the thing was, it was the same as the year previous when she had had Charlie. She developed mastitis in the same quarter instantly. So we weren't sure what was going on. We couldn't get rid of the mastitis no matter what we did. Um, it would get better, you know, and it would be almost non-existent. But it never completely went away. When we dried her off, we dried her off just as carefully as we possibly could. Um, we asked around. We did everything right. She calved, and all three quarters were beautiful, and um, except for that one, turned out with stringy, thick, mucusy milk instantly. So we started treating it. It got better. Uh, but it wouldn't go away. And I started noticing that she was uncomfortable more. She didn't really want to have people milking her. Um, she, her teats are feeling a little spongy. Her udder is so low now that I think all of her ligaments have dropped. And um, she's almost stepping on her udder now. So I asked our vet to take a milk sample and send it in. That was very expensive, but it was worth it because I just kind of had a feeling. It's one of those dreaded feelings, you know. And I had just had Annabelle show up, and I believe everything happens for a reason. So, and the very fact that when I saw the post about Annabelle, and I showed it to my husband because he keeps me in check because I have an issue with cow math, like some people have with chickens, chicken math, you know, that whole thing. Um, I have that with cows. I love cows. But I don't have a lot of property, so I need my husband to keep me in check. But he looked at, at Annabelle and he said, yeah, I think we need to get her. Go ahead. Really? You said that? So we got her. And I started thinking... There's a reason we're supposed to get Annabelle. I wonder if something's happening with Valentine. We sent in her milk, and I got a call from the vet. Okay, first of all, if it's good news, I get an email with a PDF showing the results from the lab as to um, how my cows are doing. As you know, as far as disease testing, they didn't call me. My vet didn't call me to tell me that my cows were completely disease free and everything looks great and what their milk protein is and you know stuff like that but he called me so I knew Valentine showed positive for staph A that was devastating now my vet was trying to explain that I don't have to call her but I knew inside I needed to because she's acting not right. She's acting unhappy. We separated her, and so now she's basically grandma to the baby calves. Um, she won't let them nurse on her. She will only let her baby nurse on her, which is fine because weaning Elsie, my oldest one, leaving her with Valentine, she's not going to nurse. Valentine won't let her. So I asked the vet about, um, 
you know, the milk? Is it going to be a problem for Molly? She said, no, Molly will not carry it. It'll be okay. It'll be in her mouth for a little while, but it'll be fine. It's not going to be something that will stick with her. But Valentine is going to be contagious to the rest of my herd. And I can't have uh, my herd exposed to a disease for which there is no cure. So after discussing this with our mentor um, who does uh, Dexter cows, we made the decision that we have to call her. And that breaks my heart. Um, Valentine is the most special cow I've ever had. the right thing to do while she's happy, while she's content, and while she's got calves to bully around her, which she just loves. I can't breed her because that'll just make the staff worse. And I can't have her around the other cows because it can transfer, which means she would go through the winter by herself alone in a stall, and I won't do that to her. So she and the steer will go in together. Now I say go in. They're going to be put down here on our farm. They'll never know fear. So that means that my primary milkers will be Annabelle and Daisy and some with Minnie, although Minnie's place here on our farm is mostly going to be a nurse cow. Uh, and then milking, yes, she does fine with milking, but her value is not in her milk so much as it is in her um, willingness to adopt other calves and nurse them. I just have to make sure I keep her weight up. She does tend to uh, give up herself so much that she loses weight. So we need to make sure she's healthy. So that's what's going on for Valentine. I find this out on Monday. <sighs> Breaks my heart. And then Thursday, go pick up those chicks. Friday, almost all of them are killed. I have to take care of them. Um, so, but the good point is, on the chicks, uh, somebody saw my post on Facebook about everything that was happening and anonymously sent me 10 meat birds from Hoover Hatchery. That was so nice. So if you're watching this, thank you so much. That was just such a bright spot. It doesn't matter how many. What matters is that somebody out there cared so much, and they sent me those meat birds. So all that to say, it's been rough. I've got tendonitis in my arms very badly. Um, my chiropractor is a little concerned. So I'm not hand milking now. I am just using the machine, which is great. But it also means I can't grab weeds and pull weeds out of my garden. So I don't have a garden this year. It's totally overrun. So no garden. Whatever grows, grows. I've got volunteer potatoes from last year. I've got some garlic that's growing well. And I've got some volunteer tomato plants that are like, I don't know, three feet tall. So I'll probably get some tomatoes from my garden, but my focus is going to be supporting local farmers in the area. This year, that's just going to be where I'm going to be. That's just what I'm going to do. Um, on top of all of that, trying to get the house done, taken care of. Um, yeah, it's just been a little bit nuts. Uh, most of my kids are working now, so I hired in a couple of uh, teenager boys to... Um, kind of pick up the slack for me. They have done an amazing job. I'm going to go show you how I wash my surge milker and show you all the different parts. And then we will go out and milk Daisy and Annabelle and show you about that. Okay, let's go check out the surge milker and hopefully that'll help you guys as far as how to use a surge milker, how easy is it to clean and put back together and pretty much the names of all the parts and I'm not an expert at all but hopefully it'll shed some light and make it a little easier for you guys okay let's go check it out well before I show you 
about how I wash my surge milker. Uh, I'm going to wash these dishes and kind of get my kitchen a little bit cleaner so that I can show the surge milker to you a little bit better. So while I'm doing some dishwashing, you guys can enjoy some cute, a uh, short, cute vi video of putting the cows all together in pasture for the very first time. Um, they're not that way anymore. And I explained why with Valentine and stuff. But for a little while, it was just really nice to be able to enjoy all nine, <laughs> nine cows together in pasture. And I've got some cute clips and pictures of our bull so gentle with the calves. So you guys go ahead and enjoy that. I'm gonna wash dishes. <laughs> right here and yes I've got fly tape we live on a farm we've got lots of flies so and it's a huge pain and I really hate it but I have found that fly tape works the best and it's gross and it's disgusting but I haven't found anything else that works as well we've got fly traps outside um, so yeah it's just gross um, all right, so we've got the lid, and I've already relieved the pressure on it, so I'm just going to unhook the lid, okay, set it down, and I'm going to disconnect all of these hoses from this center square piece known as the pulsator because the pulsator cannot get wet. I've got all my little vacuum hoses disconnected. To take the pulsator off, turn it about a quarter turn like that, and then it just pulls right off. Okay? So, and then the same to hook it back on, get it seated on there, and you can kind of feel it grab. It's a little tight to turn it, and now it's not going to come off. All right. I've tried. It's really hard to get this off, um, the pulsator off, or yeah, the pulsator off or on if it's still if the lid is still on the surge on the milker uh, tank. So take the lid off, then take the pulsator off. Uh, there's videos on how to clean this. 
and there's some videos that are from people way more accomplished than I am so look up those videos to clean the uh, pulsator for me I'm just setting it aside all right so now I've got my lid and I can just connect these little hoses these little vacuum hoses and I don't I don't wash them every time in fact I really don't wash them very much at all because no milk gets into these vacuum hoses the vacuum hoses simply give vacuum pressure in the tank to hold the lid on and they also provide the squeeze motion of the inflations on the cow so no milk ever goes through these still you know if one of my cows is itching her udder or something like that she may touch one of these manure I don't like that around so you know use your own discretion okay so now I've got the vacuum hoses off and now I've just got my inflations on and each one of these just pulls right off just like that so that you're left with that okay so I've got my inflation with the little yellow plugs on them still these are these can be very very hard to take off uh, and that's why I will rub a little bit of olive oil on the outside of the silver little uh, prongs that stick out not inside where milk will flow so right right around here I'll just put some olive oil with my fingers just very gently I won't let any olive oil go in there okay and it's just a tiniest little bit but it just allows the inflation hose to just slip right on and then comes right off it's so much easier all right this can go into the dishwasher but we're not done yet that rubber gasket this is the lid gasket seal comes off and then this is what your lid will look like now if you're buying something off of eBay it probably does not have this little check valve piece okay um, in fact if it's all original parts um, the check valve will actually peel right off okay so I lost my check valve and had to order a new one from parts department online online this is what the little check valve looks like okay or something very very similar an original not a rebuilt an original will fit right in through here and then just hang and you know it'll hang just like this one did when parts department was making these they made them just a teeniest bit too big so I called them and they said take the little black rubber stopper off this is so cool the little rubber stopper off of this lid off of this little check valve so that I'm just left with the uh, steel post fit the small end through there so that it sticks out put the little rubber piece back on like that and now it functions exactly the same as my original and it doesn't come out but there's still enough gapping there that I can run this through the dishwasher and I'm not having any trapped bacteria in there because it's still it's pretty loose but this rubber stopper is not going to allow it to fall out and the metal post isn't going to allow it to fall out the other way all right so this can go into the dishwasher or you can hand wash it it's totally up to you I'm gonna hand wash it but I first want to show you uh, these are the uh, little yellow plugs from Amazon or not Amazon eBay I got these from eBay they're wonderful because sometimes I have a cow that uh, one of her teats may be really sore and needs to be hand milked so I'll just leave the plug in on that inflation and it won't be attached to her but all the rest of them are functioning just fine 
Um, okay. But you have your stainless steel or your steel cups, inflation cups. They're also known as shells. Um, and they will have mine, if they're original to Surge, it'll have a little, you know, emblem, logo on it that says Surge on it, or Babson Brothers or something of that nature. Um, sometimes it'll have a serial number in case you have to refer to it again. Um, the inflations will have some serial numbers along here. And brand name, this is Westphalia Surge. All right, so that's how I'm going to know you know, when I have to replace these, what to replace them with, okay? So take them off, pull it all the way through. Now you're left with, this is the inflation, okay? This is the, the steel cup or shell, inflation cup or inflation shell. This is a standard bore, so this is made, bore meaning the hole through here and I think maybe the hole through here, but I know for sure this. This is made for a cow. This is not made for a goat. You can get inflations that are made for a goat. And I think they make them so that they will still fit this, but talk to somebody more knowledgeable than me. But this is a standard and it does fit my cows, except for Minnie. Her teats are so super small that she is more like a goat. We can still get it to work. It just doesn't work very well. Um, I probably will invest in getting some narrow bore inflations for her and I'll probably get uh, a set of cups so that I can just transfer everything over immediately for her uh, when I have to milk her. Um, okay, so now I can wash these and I've got a whole host of brushes that I like to use. I've got this. It fits nicely into here, but I can also put this in the dishwasher too. Um, I can put this in the dishwasher. Only thing is you want to make sure that you're getting right inside this inflation because bacteria can collect inside of there. If you stick your finger in there, you'll feel the little kind of canal in there. Just make sure you get that really, really nice and clean. Um, but I've got a brush for that as well. I got these from Myers. It's just like a little bottle brush, but it fits in perfectly. It's not super long, so it doesn't go all the way through, but I can pull it back out and then I can put it through that way. Okay, so you can wash it that way. Nice hot soapy water. And then I've got this teeny tiny little, this is more for like a straw brush, you know, but it fits perfectly through this vacuum hose. Fits better when it's wet. And it sticks out just a little bit on the other side so I don't need to run it the other direction. Okay? But this also can go through the dishwasher. Um, this can go through the dishwasher. Pretty much the only thing that does not go into the dishwasher is this big tank and of course the pulsator. So I'm gonna go ahead and wash this all up and um, I will put it all back together and you guys can see how I put it back together and get it ready for milking. Make sure everything's very, very dry. Inside the inflations, the rubber inflations, it doesn't matter if it's perfectly dry um, because you are going to have milk. That is where liquid goes. But inside this cup, it should be dry. That's where your vacuum hose is going to go. That is dealing with just air, not um, milk. So that should be very, very dry. And every couple of weeks, depending on how messy my uh, vacuum hose is looking that's out in the barn, 
um, I'll bring that, I'll disconnect that hose and bring it in and um, soak it in some bleach water. I'm not worried about that one as much, but I don't want any transference of bacteria at all, so I just take that extra step. Uh, and I don't mind putting it in with bleach water. No milk goes through there. There's no food issues going through there at all. The point there is simply kill bacteria. Um, just I'm trying to be as you know safe as we possibly can uh, and free from bacteria as we possibly can. And then just as a side note, I mentioned Valentine has Staph A. Okay, Staph A is extremely contagious. Uh, that being said, she doesn't get milked with a milking machine. Okay, so, uh, and we had tried the milking machine on her at one time, but never with that teeth, because we knew the, uh, before it was, uh, before we knew that it was staph, we thought it was just mastitis, but still, common sense, you don't do that if you've got mastitis in a teeth, you don't introduce that into your equipment. So we kept the machine off of that teat. So we're pretty comfortable with uh, the fact that we kept it safe. Plus, these have gone through the dishwasher multiple times through the heat and the um, soap, the cleaning detergents, everything, bleach water, whatever, um, since milking her. So I'm not worried about it at all. Um, yeah. All right, you can, I don't know how well you can see, but there's like a valley in here that fits into the rim of the uh, shell. Make sure that that's really dry because it will collect water. You just always check the condition of the rubber. You don't want any signs of drying or cracking in your rubber. Um, That can introduce bacteria because it, it doesn't have as good a seal as it should. I would recommend do not put this through the dishwasher every day. Um, you're dealing with rubber here, so it shouldn't go through the dishwasher every day. Uh, it can crack and dry out the um, inflations, the seals. So maybe once a week. <sighs> Generally on a maintenance level, I'll just run super, super hot water through my stuff without disconnecting everything. I'll just leave the shells on my, uh, the inflations in the uh, shells, stainless steel cups, and the vacuum, little vacuum hoses on, and I'll just run super, super hot water through it on a really good hot rinse and then hang the lid up um, to dry. But you know that's that's just me. Um, I hesitate about using vinegar. I've heard vinegar can cause cracking on uh, the rubbers. So I, I'm hesitant to use that, and I will rarely use bleach. And really, I don't mind washing this. Um, now, maybe it's just me. I've got a big, huge window here so I can look outside and enjoy the uh, outdoors while I'm doing this, so I don't mind washing dishes. And, you know, some people have said the trade-off is about the same as far as how much time you're spending washing your equipment versus milking. And that is true. However, when it's 10 degrees outside and I'm milking, I would rather wash stuff in the house where it's warm than take that extra 30 minutes milking outside in the cold. That's just, you know, Michigan. And honestly, I think my girls prefer the shorter milking times too. And um, 
milking three cows twice a day, the milker makes sense. Um, plus, I've got, you know, my arms won't tolerate me washing or milking, hand milking anymore. We keep leach water outside. Uh, very, very diluted bleach water with some soap and for washing the cow's udders. But then if uh, one of these inflations happens to touch their udders, or um, I'm sorry, not udders, their, their hooves, you know, and they get a little touch of manure on the outside of the inflations, it's simple enough to, and generally that happens once we've taken the inflation off. Um, but regardless, we've got clean rags out there that are kept sealed in a container and we can just grab a clean rag, dip it into that bleach water and wash off the inflation wherever the manure spot is and be able to keep going. I'll just get it really nice and hot and um, wet, kind of uh, rinsing everything off. And I'm using straight hot water. My family says that it's too hot for them to touch. It's not too hot for me. I don't want to keep my hand in it, but it's very, very hot. Make sure you wash underneath the top of it. While, uh, the milk will splash, so anything that the milk touches. Once I'm all done with this, the inside I would consider the clean part of the uh, machine. The outside is what I would consider the dirty part of the machine. So I'll wash the outside first before, uh, after I've washed the inside. Just to make sure any spots of manure, you know, I'm not transferring that to the inside of my machine. Yes, I'm going to be washing the countertop too. But I never set my machine down on the ground where the cows walk. I set it on their uh, stanchion, as you'll see, and, um, or as you've seen. And it's on clean shavings. And then once, this, once I'm done washing everything with this rag, this dishcloth, the dishcloth goes in the laundry. I don't use it on my food items. So I grew up um, in kind of a uh, an assisted living situation of the home back in the 80s and 90s. So that's where I learned about keeping keeping things super clean, um, how bacteria travels, can travel, and uh, just the importance of keeping things over the top clean. The situation we were in, we never knew when the health department was going to show up. And they were always looking for reasons to shut us down. So my sister and I had to keep an insanely clean um, work environment. Uh, that affected then, you know, how clean we would keep bathrooms and food, uh, kitchen. And just basically always thinking about transference of bacteria um, and the dangers of all of that. Okay, I'm going to just dry off my equipment. Growing up in that environment also taught me how to cook for a lot of people. Uh, at one time we were cooking for 21 um, elderly people. Um, all the food had to be homemade and to this day I've never 
made scrambled eggs from powder. It's always been fresh eggs. I think we would go through 48 eggs for a breakfast. Okay, so this is all nice and clean. There's two parts, uh, two sides on this gasket. Which side? The smooth side fits on the lid. You have a slight ridged rim, lip, on one side. That has to attach to the uh, uh, tank because that's going to help it create a vacuum seal. So just put that on there, like that, nice and smooth. Time to put the pulsator on. Just like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and attach it to the tank. Just because how heavy it is, it's easier to manage. I'm going to dry, I'm going to dry inside the groove on the outside of this inflation because I really want to make sure that it's not going to be adding water to my vacuum line. If it's a little damp, I don't worry about it too much, but I don't want any pooling water. All right, on this inflation, you've got a bunch of little grooves here, but then you've got these larger grooves here. Don't pull so hard that you get these to come through the steel cup or the uh, shell, because then it's a real pain to pull this back out again. So it's kind of sticking out just a little bit. Okay. The ridges are just inside and they're actually stopping from me pulling any harder. I can pull harder and pull it all the way out you know, as far as those larger ridges here in the center, but then it's really hard to get it back out. It's a huge pain. Lesson learned. I did that. Not fun. It took a couple of us wiggling it. Um, don't twist this too much because then the twist on your cow can be kind of cockeyed. Try to keep it straight. You can look inside of it and see the reflection and if you twist on purpose you can see the little shine in there kind of getting all spirally. So just, you know, figure it out. Okay, I look through here till I can see the end. If I see little droplets in there, I blow them out. Again, I don't worry about, this is not touching milk, this is not touching food, okay? So it attaches here, but remember, between this shell and the rubber is an air space. This is what connects to this and causes that air space to become pressurized, vacuum pressurized. So this never touches food. We only wash it because the, you know, if she accidentally brushes it with a dirty hoof, I want to keep it clean. Okay, so this inflation is now ready to connect to the lid. However, I'm going to go ahead and put this plug in like that. I got a little bit of olive oil on my hands. I'm just going to rub a little bit of olive oil over each one of these little prongs that's sticking out. Just makes it easier to slip it on. And I'll go ahead and do these little barbs on the pulsator too. I don't do that very often. Just once in a while. Slip it on. Slips on nice and easy. Vacuum hose is on top. Connect it to the barb. That's it. Do that to all four. You're ready to go. Okay, so what I've got in my wagon, I've got my milker, white five gallon bucket that I put all the milk into, uh, empty stainless steel bucket for dirty rags, a bucket for clean rags, and washing water uh, right there. So that's pretty much what I use. It's not a big deal to wash it. I think everybody's always concerned, their biggest concern about milking machine is uh, how much stuff there is to wash. It's not that big of a deal and I only go to these great huge big lengths because I do have so many cows. Oh yeah, sloppy mess. Have you been out here since the boys cleaned up out here? Um, I was out here when they were cleaning up. 
Yeah, they did an amazing job out here. It is so much cleaner out here. Oh, I forgot the cat food. Hi, Chloe. That's all right. We have treats. I can call my sunshine. Yep. That works. We just need to put the gate back on. Yeah. This is my stanchion, the feed tray. I've got my vacuum hose hooked up to my vacuum pump right there. The switch is in the back. Got a little window right here to make sure that I've got enough oil in there. And then my vacuum oil, vacuum pump oil is right there. It's really loud. Some of you have heard it before. Now I'm going to turn on some lights first. let it hang until it's done and she looks all shriveled up when she's all done it's another good thing about having these plugs yeah the bacteria doesn't get up inside Have Annabelle. It's fairly new to the uh, homestead, but she's doing great. She's putting on weight, and I suspect she's already been bred. All right. milking goes very easy and so now I can take my five gallon bucket full of milk up to the house and filter it and put it in the fridge 
and then the different people that do herd shares with me can get their milk. It is pouring rain out, so before I show you any more uh, that's going on on the property, I'm going to wait a bit until, you know, the, it stops raining so much. So, uh, until the next video, um, drop me a comment, subscribe, and uh, send me a like, share, you know, all that good stuff that you do on social media. And we will check in with you on a slightly nicer day when it's not pouring rain. That's not exactly the kind of weather I want to take you guys on a tour of my uh, muddy, watery property. So we'll go ahead and get going. And uh, happy farming, everybody. Stay dry, stay healthy.